Hello there, Andrew Kolsky with Therapy BTS, Therapy Behind the Scenes. And today we're going to be talking sleep. Sleep is such an important issue for anybody with mental health issues. And I'm really excited to have Dr. Audrey Wells here with me, who is a sleep doctor. Doctor, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. And, and thanks for having me. It's so nice to be uh, on your podcast. I really think that it's uh, entirely relevant to talk about sleep disorders in the context of therapy. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, I'm Dr. Audrey Wells. I'm a sleep medicine physician. I'm also boarded in obesity medicine and quite frequently straddle both areas uh, of specialty to interact with people and help them live better lives. Um, you know, just a side note, sleep affects everything. So it was a real pleasure to come into this field and help people feel better. I think that's something uh, that is really enjoyable for me. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I, I'm, I'm curious and I ask all my guests, like for me, for example, I started getting interested in sleep issues because I had clients who also had sleep issues related to what we were working on. Mm -hmm. What got you into sleep issues? You know, I came to sleep through pulmonary medicine. Um, so in my pulmonary training, which is a, a specialty for lungs, I was really interested in breathing and obstructive sleep apnea is one of the most common sleep diagnoses that you would get treated for in a medical uh, situation. So I became really interested in obstructive sleep apnea and when I had a taste of what improvements a person could experience as a result of getting their sleep treatment, I was hooked because it's such a remarkable difference going from sleep deprived to sleeping well, living well, and just well being day after day after day. So uh, I jumped over into sleep medicine. I've practiced uh, for about 15 years, and it's been a pleasure. Wow. Interesting. Well, I, I have a lot of questions for you about the ins and outs of what sleep medicine really means. So awesome. let me start with this one. With me, you know, I will have patients who say to me, wow, I'm having a really hard time sleeping. I can't fall asleep or I can't stay asleep. And this can be from people of all ages, genders, whatever. Um, from your perspective as a sleep doctor, what types of things might someone want to think about if someone is saying, I'm just having trouble falling and staying asleep? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of ways to approach this. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of lay it out maybe uh, in two different scenarios. So I, I think there's periods where we all go through trouble sleeping. Even me as a sleep medicine doctor who supposedly has all the tips and tricks and you know a big tool bag, I still have trouble sleeping from time to time because I'm a human being. Mm -hmm. And so if you're experiencing trouble sleeping for a relatively short period of time, there are things that you can do to get improvement that don't necessarily involve uh, seeking medical attention from your primary care provider or from a sleep medicine specialist like me. Um, so for example, uh, one thing that I think a lot of people underestimate the power of is keeping your sleep schedule regular within a 24 hour window. And it turns out that the morning wake up time is slightly more important than your bedtime at night. And that's great because you can control your morning wake up time. So your alarm goes off. And if it's very consistent day to day, even on weekends, your brain will start to predict that wake up time such that you feel more and more awake and alert, which is great. That's actually what we want from our sleep to have better, uh, memory function, better thinking during the day, better endurance and energy. So holding your wake up time steady and then getting bright light exposure when you wake up, especially paired with exercise, that's a very strong signal for awake uh, or alertness. Mm -hmm. So people can experience benefit usually after a week or two of this regimented practice. Now, if we go to the other end of the day, 
it's really important to sort of wind down at night. So wind down your body, wind down your mind. We do not have the type of brain that you can just flick the switch and turn off, unfortunately. And you know, that's a, a lot of what I hear from patients is I wish I could just turn my brain off. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, you really need to sort of land the plane. So you need to sort of identify your bedtime, which is the landing strip, and then do all the controls to wind down and have a smooth landing into sleep. So that analogy is sometimes helpful as people consider what can they improve. Now, the other piece I wanna to talk to is uh, chronic sleep problems. Now I'm curious to know what you've heard from people who have chronic or ongoing sleep issues? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, because it seems to be the same type of story, which is, you know, I try to go to bed and it's the same thing every night. I'll lay in bed and I'll just stare at the ceiling and I'll toss and turn and I try everything I know. And then they get into, you know, I tried taking some sort of over the counter sleeping mm -hmm. or, you know, wine, sometimes marijuana, you know, mm -hmm. all the things that, that you can typically think of. And then they ultimately end up going to a doctor and trying to get a prescription for some sort of a, you know, prescription sleep aid. And they just struggle in that roundabout way. Yeah. And it's really frustrating, right? Because you feel like you have lost control of a bodily function that is supposed to be so innate and so natural. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk to your audience specifically, because I think people who are interested in therapy behind the scenes also might want to see sleep behind the scenes. Absolutely. And there is no psychiatric diagnosis that does not, uh, that leaves your sleep untouched. So in other words, problems with sleeping and psychiatric or psychologic diagnoses go hand in hand all the time. So the sleep problems usually end up being chronic and people usually start seeking out uh, help from their pharmacist, help from their primary care provider. They stay in bed longer. There's all of these coping mechanisms that they start to employ as they realize, oh, this is not going away anytime soon. Right. So it's not only getting to sleep, it's staying asleep too. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, when, when you have these chronic sleep issues, I think you start to tell yourself a scary bedtime story. And so some of the things I hear from people are, I've never been a good sleeper, or I've tried everything. I've tried all the pills. I've tried all the potions. I've tried sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy. And you come to this place of hopelessness. Now, I want you to picture in your mind when you lay down to sleep, mm -hmm. you're closing your eyes, you're alone. You know, even if there's a bed partner, you're still alone in the quiet and darkness. And you do what I like to call a U turn, a Y O U turn. You turn inwards, right? And when you turn inward, especially if you've got stress, a psychologic diagnosis that's not fully treated. You haven't had any white space during your day to process your emotions. You're kind of agitated, right? You feel like you have this monkey mind and even you may even get body tension as you're laying there trying to sleep. Mm -hmm. Those are all red flags to me. That tells me that the relationship you have with yourself and the nighttime is problematic. But I'd like to say it can get better. It can absolutely get better, even without pills and potions. Now you mentioned alcohol and I'll tell you, uh, some people say, you know, alcohol helps me get to sleep. And so it kind of removes that struggle, mm -hmm. but there's a problem you pay for it. So yes, you can get to sleep more quickly, but your sleep is not normal. And people who use alcohol to sleep typically have a nighttime awakening. They're dehydrated. They need to use the bathroom. They have fast heart rate and it affects REM sleep in the second half of the night, especially REM sleep is so good for your brain. It helps you to process emotions. 
-hmm. So it's sort of a feed forward mechanism as the person, you know, the next night says, oh man, I really didn't sleep last night. I need need to get good sleep tonight. I'm going to have a couple of cocktails to see if I can do that. But unfortunately the cycle would continue. Right. Is this ringing any bells for you? I'm wondering if if this is the kind of thing that you're seeing among your patients. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's as if you've worked with them, which I'm sure your patients are the same same people. Yeah. You know? um, it, it is it is interesting. The the, the one part that you just uh, were talking about with the alcohol, um, for me, the way that I learned it was that you know there are certain things that may put you to sleep earlier, make you feel sleepy, but you don't get restful sleep throughout the night. Exactly right. Exactly right. You're not going to cycle normally through the different sleep stages, which are very important to cleanse the brain of all the metabolites that accumulate during the day. You don't get as much uh, slow wave deep sleep, which is important for memory and cognition. So sometimes people have word finding difficulty. And then I mentioned the REM sleep. Um, So choppy REM sleep interrupts the processing of emotions that takes place overnight. And for people who are dealing with underlying depression, anxiety, or any of the common psychologic issues, that is problematic because you don't get a chance to kind of work through that. And that's one of the functions that dreaming uh, has or REM sleep. REM sleep is typically associated with dreaming. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're, you're removing your access to that part of your brain that helps you heal. Wow. Wow. So, so with all of this, is there hope? Definitely. And it's usually not pill shaped. I have to say, you know, um, there are sleep aids out there that are quite effective. You know, I've written a few prescriptions of Ambien in my day. And Mm -hmm. I say that kind of tongue in cheek, because um, even though I have these tools available, it doesn't mean that um, the behavioral practices shouldn't be emphasized. And it doesn't mean that pills or potions are necessary for every person that walks through my sleep clinic door. So with sleep aids, whether they're prescribed or over the counter, there's always going to be some side effects that come with them. Mm -hmm. And over time, especially with Ambien and other related Z drugs, as they're called, what's starting to come to, um, into the awareness of the medical and research communities is that these are associated with the potential for long-term memory loss or cognitive deficits they work on your brain and they're not meant to be used night after night after night after night. So I think people get in sort of a habit or they, they um, get sort of tolerant of these and they keep taking them because that's just what they do. Right. But for anybody with sleep problems, I recommend a reevaluation of the pills that you're taking so that you can move through to more healthy behavioral practices to start getting sleep more naturally. Yeah. So I, I, I definitely have a follow-up question with that, that I want to make sure that we, we make clear because I'm curious myself. So with Ambien, with any sort of prescription sleep aid, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is they are intended for a short term use only, but there's people who tend to use them as if it's a natural part of their day and the, they get into this long-term use. Am, am I right? Or should they not be using them long-term because of all the things you just said? Or what? Are, how are they designed to be used? You're right. And in my practice, what I do is every time I write out a prescription for a sleep aid, I talk to my patients about an end date. Okay. So sometimes a prescription sleep aid is necessary to get over a hump that's causing an obstacle to sleep. This could be uh, a grief reaction. This could be uh, trouble uh, getting used to CPAP therapy for obstructive sleep apnea. This could be some sort of stressor in their lives. And you know, there's, there's always sort of this plan that the prescription is not gonna last forever. And in the meantime, let's take a look at your sleep schedule and your sleep practices to see what uh, coping mechanisms are maladaptive and get you back on the right track 
to get that wholesome natural sleep that you deserve instead of kind of white knuckling it with a sleep aid prescription. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I, I think everybody can get behind the idea that you don't just want to keep throwing pills at your problems. So I like to take a dual approach. If I am going to use a prescription, always couple that with behavioral changes and even thinking or cognitive restructuring. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, part, part of me is a little bit disappointed inside because I'm, I first heard, oh, I can take a pill and it's going to help me sleep. And now you're taking the pill away after a certain amount of time. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, then aren't I going to just end up laying awake again all, all, all night? But now you're saying that therapy, some sorts of therapy added to it might be the long-term solution is, is, um, am I getting that right? You are. Yeah. And, and, you know, there are some medications that are taken for the long term, and, you know, maybe the person doesn't have deficits or maybe they're not measured. I, I just think it's always hard to say. And my personal stance is that pharmacology has a place in your health for something that's indicated, but people routinely underestimate the power of their own thoughts and behaviors in promoting healthy and natural sleep. So part of my role is to work with folks who have um, emotions at night that are not compatible with sleep or mm -hmm. ruminative thinking at night that's not compatible with sleep. I do not want to sort of band-aid that with an ambient prescription. I wanna help somebody work through those issues so that they have a better relationship with their self, themselves and then they feel peaceful and relaxed as they're getting into bed for sleep. Yeah. Um, you know, that's by far the best way to go. And that's the, um, I think that's the part that's really underdeveloped in the healthcare delivery system. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm hearing, I think is that there's a certain number of folks who maybe are dealing with, let's, let's call it insomnia. So they're having a, a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep. But uh, are there other things, are there other medical conditions that maybe they should be thinking about that might also be a possible reason that they're not sleeping? Uh, you are very insightful. And I'm so glad you asked this because one risk of taking a sleep aid, and again, this is maybe prescribed, maybe over the counter, a risk of taking a sleep aid is masking or suppressing arousals from sleep because you've got a medical sleep condition. Now, pure insomnia does exist, but very commonly I have seen someone come into me just frustrated because they can't sleep even with a prescription or they want a prescription. And when I test them for other conditions, I find something that the sleep aid would mask. So uh, for example, obstructive sleep apnea is a very common condition. Right now, uh, only about 6 million people in the United States have been diagnosed, but it's estimated that about 30 million people have obstructive sleep apnea that's clinically significant. Wow. So just to put this in more tangible terms, that's uh, for adults over 30 years old, that's one out of three men and one out of five women. Okay. Wow. So I'm just going to let that land for a second. Yeah, that's huge. It's huge. It's so common. Now, when I describe what obstructive sleep apnea is, I want you to think about what it would be like to have a sleep aid on board. Okay. Okay. So when you go to sleep, all the muscles in your body relax. That's normal. Okay. okay. The muscles in the back of your throat are part of that relaxation. And when you're lying down, those muscles relax and they can collapse your airway as you're going to sleep or even in sleep. And then you're not able to pull air into your lungs. That means you're not breathing because your airway is obstructed. Okay. Okay. Now the obstruction can occur anywhere from the back of the nose down to the windpipe where that airway is soft and flexible. If you don't breathe well, your blood is not going to be oxygenated. So your blood oxygen levels come down. 
That means your heart is starved of oxygen. That means your brain is starved of oxygen. And last time I checked, those are your two main organs. So when you drop your oxygen levels, your brain, which is doing the sleeping, is sensitive to that and it will wake from sleep to breathe again because it contracts the muscles surrounding your airway and you can take some recovery breaths. Hmm. Now, I just want to reiterate the two problems with obstructive sleep apnea are drops in your blood oxygen level right. and interruptions in sleep. Okay. And this can occur dozens of times per hour of sleep. So for let's say moderate sleep apnea, you can have a hundred airway obstructions and drops in your oxygen level over the course of a night. A hundred. <laughs> okay. Now let's go back to what I was saying before about the sleep aid. The sleep aids job is to suppress awakenings or arousals from sleep. So if you have undiagnosed, untreated sleep apnea, your brain is quite sluggish in waking up to breathe. That means your oxygen levels can keep going down, 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 down. And this is difficult for your body to deal with. When you do wake up, your heart rate goes up. Your brain is in its fight or flight mode because you're breathing. Literally the thing that you need to stay alive is threatened. It's no wonder that people have increased anxiety with untreated obstructive sleep apnea, because it is literally a threat to your life. Wow. So then let me ask, I, I have several questions related to this, but my first question is, since you're describing it as, you know, the muscles kind of relaxing and maybe pressing against each other. Could I change that just by changing my position of sleep? Some people can, some people can. Um, but I'll caution you that one of the myths about obstructive sleep apnea is if I don't snore, I don't have it. And in my description, I said nothing about snoring. Okay. Right. Right. This is related to your question about positioning, because sometimes people will start snoring on their backs. So they just think I'm going to sleep on my side instead. So bedtime comes, they snuggle in, they're sleeping on their side and they're not snoring. The problem with that is, and I know this because I'm entering my fifth decade pretty soon. Um, is that when you're lying on your side all night, your shoulders, your hips, your knees, your, your neck and your lower back tend not to tolerate that position for eight hours. Mm. So you move to your back during your sleep when you're unconscious and then you can start snoring and you don't know it because right. you're asleep and right. your bed partner, if you have one, may not know it because presumably they're asleep too. And so you stay on your back, you know, kind of uh, choking and gasping. So the positional question is something that would need to be worked out in a sleep study. It's not that somebody would necessarily know that they could avoid sleep apnea just by getting onto their side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you just said the, the term sleep study, which, which relates to my next question, which is, okay, so... So I'm having this trouble sleeping, um, you know, I'm not able to really figure it out. Someone suggests maybe you have sleep apnea. What things are available for me to find that out? Do I have to go into a sleep center and get hooked to all sorts of wires and all these things? Because that's kind of scary. Totally. And I've seen this question before, even with the tone laced throughout, like total <laughs> reluctance, right? And, you know, I, I think I, I just want to highlight a couple of things that I think people are fearful of. One is they're afraid they're not going to sleep. And the second one is they're worried that at the end of the sleep study, there's going to be a big CPAP machine waiting for them and they're going to have <laughs> to take it home and, and wear it for the rest of their lives, right? So these are the fears that people have about sleep studies, and it can unfortunately keep them from even getting evaluated. So I want to encourage everybody who's watching or listening to put that fear aside if you can. And I'm going to help uh, 
explain why you should. The sleep study, whether it's in the sleep lab or at home, is to get information about your health. That's it, okay? So you make decisions. Somebody like me just gives you the information that you need to make those informed decisions. So I'd really encourage anybody who's having trouble, go get tested, see what it's about so you can make an informed decision because this is your health we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There are uh, in-lab sleep studies, and historically, this is how sleep studies were developed. Anyone who's been through one, it makes a big impression on them. And I've been through four, so I can tell you they're uncomfortable. It's kind of weird. Um, and the, the worry that you're not going to sleep or the test won't reveal anything, I, I wouldn't worry about that so much because the advantage of an in-lab sleep study is that your brain waves are monitored objectively. And that's how I know whether you're asleep or not. I don't have to rely on you trying to determine if you were. So the software that I use just takes out all of the wake and lets me look at your sleep. And I don't need seven or eight hours of continuous sleep to make a good diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So that's an advantage of an in-lab sleep study. Another advantage is that an in-lab sleep study tests for many sleep disorders. And if you think about it, it's kind of a blind spot because you, the person sleeping, are unconscious. So I'm sort of shining a light on this blind spot in your life that you can't really tell me about. You can tell me about the after effects during the day or what your bed partner might see. But um, the in-lab sleep study really uncovers uh, a bunch of different diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And that's in contrast to a home sleep apnea test. Now, I'm saying these words very deliberately. A home sleep apnea test only tests for sleep apnea. Okay. And it was really developed to test people who had a high pretest probability. Why? because a home sleep apnea test is only beneficial if it's positive. If it's negative, especially in a person who's symptomatic, that could be a false negative result. Now, the home sleep apnea test is more convenient. There's fewer sensors. You can do it at home. Some kits are disposable. There's, it's cost-effective for sure. So there's a lot of advantages but if a home sleep apnea test is negative, you have not learned very much at all. So yeah. I want to point out that difference because I know there's people out there who've had a negative sleep apnea test and they sort of feel reassured. But if you're still symptomatic, go back and get the more uh, accurate test because you may have been falsely reassured. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me this. Because I'm sure there's a, a number of people watching this podcast who have never done any kind of sleep test and don't really know what this all means. So, so two questions. One, when you're talking about a home test, can you give us a better sense of what types of wires and devices and materials might be available? And the second part of that is when you're talking about a sleep lab test, we picture, you know, wires and all these things. And the question related to the wires is, are those needles being stuck in me? Mm. And also, are there, I picture myself laying in this bed with all these doctors in white coats, watching through the window, watching me all night with the little clipboard, taking notes. Tell us more about both of those. Let's start with the scary one first. Um, okay. <laughs> I would love to be able to say that I uh, routinely stay up all night watching people sleep, but <laughs> the truth is um, my sleep is very fragile. So I have to do a lot to keep it in check. Um, you are recorded, you know, there is a video recording during an in-lab sleep study, but you are in the room alone unless you have a caregiver or, you know, unless you're a child who has a parent, um, you're just recorded with a remote camera. And it's kind of like if you've ever been in an MRI test, you know, somebody's watching you, they can talk to you through the mic system, um, but they're not physically there in the room with you. 
Um, so the sleep technician is there to make sure all of the signals are uh, going well and giving the right um, data. They're there to help you if something gets pulled off in the middle of the night. No needles, by the way. They're all mm. stickers applied with a little bit of glue, or they are uh -huh. literally just uh, medical tape. Good. Um, and you know, the sleep technician also sometimes starts people on a treatment like CPAP if they're showing like really concerning sleep apnea. So you do have a lot of sensors placed on your body. There's about 20 to 25, but you should be able to move around in bed without mm. concern. You can sleep in whatever position makes you happy. You can bring, uh, I always tell people, bring your pillows from home. I'm, I happen to be very particular about my pillows. Um, bring blankets from home. You can't usually bring pets or kids, but you know, the, the point is you can, you can set yourself up for success by just making your room a little bit more comfortable with some familiar items. Mm -hmm. um, typically the test starts 9 PM, 10 PM, not necessary to fall asleep right away. Um, and then the test would end usually around six o'clock in the morning. The sleep technician comes in to help you remove all of the sensors. And then you go home at that point or have someone pick you up from the lab. So that's the in-lab sleep study. I'm going to pause there and see if you have any questions about that. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you explained that all those wires and things are not needles, but they're just kind of stuck, you know, to me. Um, I'm also happy that there's not somebody standing over me with a clipboard. Um, it's certainly not me. Creepy. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very creepy. But I, I, I can imagine, do, do, do you run into some people who just because they're in a strange place in a strange bed are not able to fall asleep because of that, not because of some sleep disorder? Yeah. And, and I, kept very careful stats on my patients over the last uh, 15 years. And I can tell you in that amount of time, and I've seen close to 50,000 patients, that's happened eight times, everybody. So usually there is some sleep captured. It may be the case that that's not enough sleep to make a good diagnosis, but that also is in the minority. Usually people do have enough sleep to figure out what's going on. Um, and I'll mention too that, you know, shift work is not terribly uncommon these days. And there right. is such a thing as a daytime in lab sleep study. So if uh, anybody's watching who works shifts uh, and you prefer to sleep in the day, that is available at many places. Let's go on to talking about the home sleep apnea test. Yeah. Now there's very wide variability in these different test mechanisms. Um, sometimes uh, the older style tests have the little nasal cannula. It looks like an oxygen uh, cannula, mm -hmm. but it's actually measuring airflow in and out. Um, it has stretchy bands on your chest and your belly to measure how much work of breathing you have. It also measures heart rate. There is a recording pulse oximeter. Uh, that means you're going to get your blood oxygen measured throughout the night and recorded about every four seconds or so. And uh, some uh, home sleep apnea tests have snore sensors, position monitors. Some even have leg sensors to monitor your muscle tone. Um, so that's, uh, that's a type of test kit that is really sensor heavy. Uh, another type of home sleep apnea test just slips over one of your fingers. And then there's sort of a thing that looks like a watch that it connects to. Um, there are some rings available that are coming up into um, kind of the options for sleep medicine doctors to order. So there's a pretty wide variety of home sleep apnea tests, and they have different levels of accuracy as well. And I'll tell you that for people who really struggle with getting to sleep and staying asleep, that is a situation where you're more likely to have a false negative test because strangely enough, a home sleep apnea test doesn't actually measure sleep. It hmm. sort of derives sleep, okay? But it doesn't measure sleep in the way that an in-lab sleep test does with those sensors right on your scalp to look at your brain waves. Wow. Wow. 
so so if we go back to the stone ages when we didn't have any of these sensors or electronic devices or anything are there clues that someone should be aware of that maybe they have a bed partner or somebody who is uh you know hearing them throughout the night are there things that they should be looking for yeah there are, uh, and I want to give the caveat that even in the absence of sleep symptoms, you still could have a sleep disorder. An example is I routinely get uh, referrals from cardiologists uh, looking for the source of a heart arrhythmia or a person has had stro strokes or heart attacks. I routinely get uh, referrals from uh, diabetes doctors to evaluate for sleep apnea when a person's blood sugar isn't well controlled despite medications. I also routinely get uh, referrals from psychiatrists and psychologists for people who have refractory depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, I mean, you name it. So the absence of symptoms doesn't necessarily mean there's no sleep disorder at play. Where symptoms are concerned, yes, the bed partner is very useful in reporting, although the bed partner is going to have a blind spot too, because presumably they're not standing over you watching you sleep. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, snoring, uh, I would look at snoring uh, uh, for somebody who is worried about sleep apnea, even just uh, gasping <clears throat> like that is uh, a sign of sleep apnea. Um, waking up with a headache is a red flag, especially if a person's body mass index is on the high side. And I'm talking like above 35, uh, I would be concerned about the breathing, um, acting out dreams, doing a lot of kicking or, you know, motion during sleep. That's not normal. And then when you look at the daytime symptoms, foggy brain, ADHD symptoms, trouble with memory, concentration, really running out of gas by the end of your day when, you know, just a year or two ago, you can remember being really kind of energetic and enjoying your evenings. Now you're falling asleep on the couch and nobody wants to invite you to a party because you're, <laughs> you're struggling. So, you know, these are all kind of symptoms that could point to a sleep disorder. Wow. Wow. That's a lot to think about, but it's a, it's, it's a great list of things to look for. So, so as we start to to wind up here, I'll ask you one other question that I know a lot of people have on their minds. So as, assume that there's no sleep disorder and, and maybe I'm making a bad assumption here. Is there such a thing as someone who does not have a sleep disorder, but they just happen to snore? And if there is such a thing, is there a magic cure to get them to stop? Ah, so uh, this is totally my jam because I don't think everybody has sleep apnea. Um, you know, I'm a sleep medicine doctor. I've seen this enough. Not everyone who snores has sleep apnea, but you don't know until you test, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So obstructive sleep apnea is diagnosed when you stop breathing at least five times an hour. Okay. So for a seven hour time period, you can stop breathing uh, 35 times or less and ju be just fine. Now, some people are extra sensitive and even treating mild sleep apnea is worth it. But under five times per hour is technically not a diagnosis of sleep apnea. And for people who snore, I would suggest a couple of things. One is you should be breathing through your nose. And typically when people snore, it's with their mouth open. Mm -hmm. So if you open up your nose with topical nasal steroids or breathe right strip, or even seeing your friendly neighborhood ENT doctor to see if there's a surgical um, indication for, for your nose, if you open up your nose, that may help with snoring. Okay. And and for people who don't have sleep apnea, I think it's a really good thing to do. Right. Um, you can know if you're breathing through your nose by doing some mouth taping. And this is a big fad. Uh, I saw it a lot on uh, social media and I did a lot of quotes in articles. Um, mouth taping, 
I would do that during the day first, while you're working at the computer for an hour, put some mouth tape on, make sure it's medical grade tape meant for human skin. We're not going <laughs> to our carpentry box for this, okay? So you fold down a quarter, a corner of the tape, you put it over your lips and you're working or you're doing something. And if you, you have trouble tolerating it, that's a sign your nose needs to be more open. Mm -hmm. And the reason I recommend the folded corner down is so you can take it off quickly if you start to feel anxious. You can do, <clears throat> you can do mouth taping at night, but I always recommend trying it during the day first. Right. All right. So I talked about open nose. Right. Second thing for snoring, but no sleep apnea is you can still get an oral uh, appliance or an, a mandibular advancement device. Those are the two names. It's a custom made uh, device that fits over your upper and lower teeth. And the two pieces kind of hook together to bring your jaw forward. And the idea is you're pulling your tongue out of your airway a little bit and just making room for more air passing by. And that helps for a lot of people who have primary snoring. It can also be effective for mild sleep apnea, sometimes moderate, sometimes severe sleep apnea. Um, and if you have a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea, your medical insurance may pay for that oral uh, appliance therapy. For Unfortunately for primary snoring, that does not happen. But, um, you know, I, I've had many men, it, it seems to be men who mostly ask me about this, if they could use the oral appliance, I say, sure. And I'm always a big fan of the wife that they're sleeping next to, because if I make his sleep better and the snoring goes away, I've helped her sleep as well. Right, right. Wow. Well, this has been really, really interesting and educational, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to share all of this with, with my audience. Let me ask you, because I didn't ask, where do you practice? What state are you in? I'm in Minnesota. I have uh, multiple state licensures, and uh, people can find me at www.supersleepmd. Dot com And there you'll find my courses. I have uh, four online courses. I do group coaching and I host a private Facebook group for people with sleep apnea, whether you're treated with sleep with CPAP or not. So I would invite people to uh, sign up for that and interact with me if they're having trouble. Fantastic. Wow. Great resources. I encourage people to take a look at your website and join if you feel it's going to be helpful. So thank you again for taking all of your time. I really appreciate it. I know it's been educational. I've learned a lot. So uh, I appreciate the work that you do. I'm sure it helps a tremendous number of people. I think you can tell I'm passionate about this. So it was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you.